I appreciate everybody joining us uh, for this rather quirky thing. Uh, this is Michael Stevens. I am an assistant professor at the School of Information at San Jose State University. A uh, few things to tell you about. Uh, this morning I woke up in Cape May, New Jersey. I did a, a wonderful uh, thing yesterday with the COSLINE group, uh, some of the state library representatives in the Northeast. And this morning I woke up in Cape May, New Jersey, and then I drove myself to Snowshoe Mountain uh, in West Virginia for the West Virginia Library Association. So I drove and drove and drove and drove and drove and drove and drove. And, drove. and uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a good evening to think about practice and breathing and balance. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I am here, I'm in, in this uh, resort called Snowshoe Mountain, and we discovered that connectivity was maybe a little bit of an issue. Uh, I started trying to load my slides. We had a little bit of an issue with that, too. So I decided we'd do something different for the uh, 21 folks, 20, 20 people here gathered. Um, I'm, I'm not going to click through slides. I thought I would just talk for a little bit, and then we'll open it up uh, to discuss some of this stuff. And we're going to make, um, we'll make the slides available. Uh, and then um, I'm, I think I'll do a recording for Steve and make it kind of official, make this presentation official. So you are here for uh, finding balance, reflect, reflective practice, and the profession. And again, uh, this is Michael Stevens, uh, assistant professor at, at School of Information, San Jose State. So thank you, everybody. Um, I appreciate your your patience. So um, I want to talk about reflective practice, and I want to go back to uh, my yoga practice, which I uh, have been doing for some time. The sad thing is my studio closed, so I'm kind of uh, Free falling, but I had a super great teacher uh, where I live in Traverse City, Michigan. Um, and in the winter months, it was just so nice to go. It was a warm room. It was all that cool stuff with yoga. And one day, uh, it really it really struck me that the teacher, when she, when she was talking to us, it really resonated with with me about uh, our practice as well. And she said, "What will you do with your practice today? Where will you focus your energies?" And then she said. How will you be mindful today? And that, that just struck me. Um, wow, you know, how present are we in our work? And just like today is a really good example. You know, I've, I've been uh, driving and I've been looking at my, my classes online and I've been getting emails from students and I went and met with the uh, Library Association people here. There's just so much going on. And sometimes it seems like um, there's a, a, a lot of noise. And are we really listening, for example, when someone comes to us at our, at our desks or, or at our service points and, and asks for help? And are we in the moment, if you will? So uh, to talk about this, to talk about reflective practice and to talk about finding balance and to talk about uh, being in the moment, I thought we'd talk about a few things, technology, unplugging, learning, and then reflective practice. So uh, just a real brief thing about technology. Um, I've seen this wonderful little piece of art that says, only when the technology is invisible is it of any use. And I think we could say that about the, uh, the, the PowerPoint slides. They are invisible, but uh, I get to look at them and, and kind of work through this all with you. So um, when technology becomes invisible, it becomes the most useful. It, becomes, it sort of falls away, and then it becomes that tool for getting things done. Um, if you struggle with techno lust, that's that wanting technology because it's oh so cool and oh so sexy, that can be uh, sort of a problem. I think we should aim um, to go beyond techno lust and, and look to incorporate technology into our professional lives and into the work that we do at our libraries and into our library services uh, by having a well thought plan, uh, by creating mission statements and by not overthinking what we're doing with technology. And for sure, and if you've heard me talk, you've probably heard me say this, we should use technology to extend the mission of the library, not drive it. Technology should not drive what the library does. Next thing I want to talk about is unplugging. And you may have seen articles that say, oh, yes, you should unplug, or oh, look at me, I unplugged. Um, Really, really interesting to think about how we use our devices. And I'm sitting here with my 
my MacBook Air and my iPhone here in this, this absolutely beautiful uh, lobby area here at the, re the resort up on the mountain. Um, and I'm reminded of how important the devices are and how important connectivity is. Um, I was just at IFLA uh, in France this August uh, to participate in an absolutely wonderful um, uh, session on the, the MOOC that I taught and about MOOCs in general. And I got to go to the Louvre. And it was really interesting to see how people visit the Louvre in 2014. And you may, you may know what I'm heading at here is it seemed as though everyone was viewing the art, and I'm not saying this is good or bad, was viewing the art through the lens or through the uh, screen of their devices, their phones, their smartphones, their tablets, whatever. And uh, I have a, the slide that you will see is a picture of American Gothic at the Chicago Museum. And I say, this is how we consume art in the 21st century. Um, so we're really, you know, you really have to be thoughtful about unplugging. And uh, maybe even um, unplugging is pointless. And I would point you to uh, Casey, I'm going to say this wrong, Seb's uh, New Yorker article, The Pointlessness of Unplugging, which really resonated with me. And how cool is this? I can, I'll just paste it in there for you. Um, so uh, Seb, Keb, uh, The Pointlessness of Unplugging. The author says, uh, unplugging suggests that the selves we are online aren't authentic and that the relationships that we forge in digital spaces aren't meaningful. And this is odd because some of our closest friends, and this, listen to this, some of our closest friends and most significant professional connections are people we have only met on the internet. Think about this, folks. Think about the people that you have only met on the internet that you count among your significant professional connections. So interesting to me to think about this idea that that maybe uh, instead of unplugging and saying, oh, look at me, I've unplugged for a week and I haven't touched my phone. Um, oh, good. Okay, nice. Rachel, the slides uh, have opened. That's good. And hopefully um, everybody can get to them. Or Molly, is there a way to send those since they have, I think they must have finished uploading. Um, instead of saying, oh, I'm unplugging for a week or whatever. Now, what's interesting is sometimes when I talk about this and I talk about um, how, we, I, how people seem to really enjoy their devices, uh, somebody always raises their hand and says, well, wait a minute. Um, I don't think uh, that our kids should have all these things. They shouldn't be staring at their screens all the time. And a lady actually did this in the talk I gave. She, she stood up and she said, I want to take away the iPad and send them outside. They are not in the moment. And I countered that with, well, I remember in 1976 when my mother, in the summer of 76, Bicentennial, took away my Hardy Boys book and sent me outside to play. So it's kind of the same thing, right? But what's interesting is now uh, instead of just maybe reading passively, uh, young people, all of us, were connected and um, were interacting socially. And I will point you to a wonderful book called It's Complicated, The Social Lives of Network Teens by Dana Boyd. Um, Boyd writes uh, that most teens, and she's done research for 10 years on how young people use technology. This is incredible research to take a look at. She says, mo uh, most teens are not compelled by gadgetry as such. They are compelled by friendship. The gadgets are interesting to them primarily as a means to a social end. So what she is saying and what she's found in her research is that is how young people connect to their social world. So I think instead of saying, oh, look at me, I'm unplugging. And you know what? I'm all about going on vacation and not being entirely connected. And uh, I see Jenny uh, in New Zealand, we were talking right before we started, and it was about a year ago that I was in New Zealand. And we had a couple days that were just blissfully and wonderfully unplugged because, kind of like I am right now, we were so far away from being connected. It was just so nice. But maybe having that balance and maybe recognizing that, yeah, I will have time when I am not holding my phone. And I will have time. Um, for family or for spiritual pursuits or for friends or whatever it might be.
So the next thing I want to talk about under the guise of reflective practice uh, and finding balance is the concept of learning. Um, Thomas Friedman writes in The World is Flat that being adaptable in a flat world is knowing how to, knowing how to learn how to learn. Uh, and he says that will be one of the most important assets any worker can have. And don't you think that for us and our jobs, which is so filled with rampant technological and societal change, uh, that learning how to learn can be such an important thing. Um, sometimes we say we're a learning organization in our libraries. And what exactly does that mean? Uh, I think that means a few things. I think that means that we have to uh, have a, a systematic and a planned um, mechanism for staff to be continuously learning. It is not just staff development day. It is not just flipping through library journal. And yay, I, I write for library journal and I love it. But it's not just flipping through library journal for an hour while you're on your guest shift or whatever. Um, I argue for administrators promoting a culture of learning all year long. And there's some wonderful um, programs that can actually help us uh, learn, continuously learn in our jobs. Many of you, and go ahead and give a shout out if you've taken the Learning 2.0 or 23 Things program. If you've been involved in the much newer and super exciting Mobile 23 Things program. Um, or if you have done a MOOC, a massively open online course. I was very lucky a year ago at this time, while I was traveling to New Zealand and doing some other things and teaching, um, to teach for San Jose, for the School of Information, um, a MOOC version of my class called the Hyperlinked Library. And we had, uh, we had a great time, absolutely wonderful, with about 400 professionals um, from all over the world. And many of the folks in the MOOC had been confronting their own ideas of what it means to be a learner in a new and unsettling landscape. And uh, one of them actually just put it out there and said, yeah, I'm, I'm here in this MOOC really to figure out how it all works from my campus. And I think that was entirely uh, an acceptable uh, thing to be doing in the MOOC. Absolutely. Um, we're, we've done some extensive research. Kyle Jones was my co-instructor for the Hyperlink Library MOOC. We had some excellent uh, guest lecturers and people that contributed in various ways. We've done a lot of research, Kyle and I. We have um, articles coming out. I think we'll have one out in the Journal of um, uh, the Journal of Education of Library and Information Science. Jealous uh, here in the next few weeks. And uh, one of the things we found uh, in what people identified were their takeaways was. Um, new ideas about how people learn, um, and a, a really sort of a, uh, an invigorated sense of their professional um, purpose. So this is something you might look for. Look for um, a MOOC to take that, that might resonate with you, a topic that resonates with you. Uh, my school offers uh, on, ongoing large-scale learning. Other LIS schools do. And what I would like to see is library associations and consortia, et cetera, et cetera get together and actually uh, offer large-scale learning as well. So uh, there are some great opportunities for learning. And now I'll go on um, to some thoughts about uh, reflective practice. Now reflective practice is mindfulness to the nth degree. And that's being very thoughtful about the decisions that we make, about the projects that we take on, and about how we put ourselves out there in the online world. I think all of that is a part of it. And uh, it is, it's a decision-making process. And it's taking in a lot of information and then making a mindful uh, and well-chosen decision. But I'm not saying that you're going to take like six months to make the decision. It also needs to be nimble and quick. And maybe that's trusting your instincts and trusting that uh, blink uh, type, uh, blink of the eye decision-making. Uh, I think one of the things that we, uh, we should think about as we focus on our practice is what our mission is. And uh, sometimes when it, it boils down for me, I think about the missions of libraries uh, as how can we help people change their lives or how can we change people's lives, be it uh, in university, be it in K-12, through or be it in the public library uh, or any other types of libraries, of course. Um, I like to think of the, the library as being everywhere 
and as we make decisions about technology, we make decisions about getting the library out, that that might be part of it as well. Um, if you've heard me talk, you've heard me say I believe the library should be human and we should allow our uh, human side to come through and we should share that. Uh, another shout out to our friends down in New Zealand, um, to the good folks, the good librarians at the Christchurch libraries who work so hard tweeting uh, under um, and, and just doing so many wonderful things. And I, I like to highlight their, their, their Twitter page, uh, Christchurch Libraries, so if somebody wants to paste that in, uh, a link to their Twitter page. I love it because you see the faces um, of the folks who are tweeting. Um, and, and you can align that with uh, their initials uh, that they sign on their tweets. It is so cool. And I visited Christchurch a year ago and was moved by how much damage there had been from the earthquakes and how resilient the library folk that I spent time were. So a shout out to those folks. Holly, thank you so much for pasting that in. So cool. And Nell, Nellie, Nell too. Thank you so much for pacing that in. Everybody take a look there. Um, I think every library should do this with their Twitter account. I just think it's sharp as sharp can be. So a um, little bit more about humanity uh, and of course uh, about heart and that's, that's where I want to wind up today and that's yesterday when I spoke to the good librarians in Cape May. That's where we ended up too talking about humanism and our practice. And I reminded them that Randy Posh in his uh, last lecture said, there is more than one way to measure profits and losses. On every level, institutions can and should have a heart. Uh, I think we should aim for that. I think we should aim for encouraging the heart of our users. And I'm reminded of another favorite quote. Lawrence Clark Powell uh, wrote a very long time ago, a good librarian is not a social scientist, a documentalist, a, revital, uh, a retrievalist, sorry, <laughs> or an automaton. A good librarian is a librarian, a person with good health and warm heart, good health and warm heart, trained by study and seasoned by experience to catalyze books and people. We might change that word, that word books, and I don't mean to be beating up on books at all, I'm not. Um, we might change that to knowledge. We might change that to information. We might change that to, you know, the world, to catalyze the world and people, whatever we want to say uh, to represent where we are in the 21st century. So how might we go forward? How might we find our way? Yeah, that is a great quote, Rachel. That one really resonates with me. How might we find our way forward as you, as you all or wherever you all are, wherever you all are right now, and as I sit on top of a mountain in West Virginia and we have friends on the other side of the world and friends scattered about the United States here, uh, how might we find our way forward for finding balance in our reflective, reflective practice? Uh, I would urge you all to be very transparent about what you're doing, to be open, uh, to be honest, uh, about your learnings, about your uh, what you want to take on uh, in your work. Uh, do that with your coworkers. Do that with your supervisor. Do that with the people that you supervise. Uh, be open, transparent, communicate. Look for ways to break down barriers that might come between uh, users and library services. Uh, work toward mapping your strategy. Have have a map and. Uh, Help that be your, your, uh, your guidelines or your, your mileposts for what you want to accomplish in your professional practice, in the work you do, maybe your project management for the things you're working on. If you're leading a team, it's a really good way uh, to, to lay things out. It might, and, and for me, sometimes I carry around a pad with a list of things that I have cooking. It's not super high tech, but it works. And uh, I urge everyone to always remember to let our core values guide everything we do. Come back to those core values of librarianship, those things that, the, the reasons we do what we do. Let those guide what we do, the decisions we make, and evaluate everything we're doing to make sure they align with those core values, make sure they align with the strategies that we have uh, identified and maybe the pathways forward, and make sure that everything points toward helping our users. For sure, we want to watch the horizon. We want to see what the next thing is and the next thing. I was very lucky 
uh, this last spring and into the summer to work on the 2014 uh, Horizon Report for uh, academic and research libraries. That is out as well. It's very interesting to see what the group of 50 uh, folks identified as the things affecting academic and research libraries. Um, take a look, but also take a look at the, the regular Horizon Report. There's some great stuff there. Um, I would also look at things like the IFLA Trend Report and other things uh, in your personal learning networks. Uh, also, be sure to always be learning. Look for ways to continuously learn, be it a wonderful experience like this conference, like Library 2.014, uh, a MOOC, uh, what, wherever you find yourself, whatever you can find a way to find some learning, um, go for it. It might be uh, very simple. It might be uh, maybe a little more involved. And also remember to have fun. Have fun with what you're doing. Um, I, I think right before we started here, I was a little stressed, and maybe I should have reminded myself that I enjoy doing this, and I enjoy kind of leaning over here on my table, talking into my computer, so you all can hear me because this does energize me. So remember that we we kind of came to this because we enjoy it. So remember that uh, that uh, have fun, and know that it's okay to fail. Know that it's okay to make mistakes, and that's how we learn as well. So think about your personal learning network. Think about all the voices that you pull into it, who you follow on Twitter, um, who you uh, uh, follow on Facebook or, or uh, in real time. Uh, all of those are part of your personal learning network. And uh, finally, uh, bring your heart with you. And uh, for those of you that are looking at the beautiful photo that we uploaded, this is one of the last slides I have in the slide deck. Um, uh, right, but right after uh, a slide I have that says, "Let your heart, let the heart drive change." So bring your heart with you, and let the heart drive change. And what that means to me is, please remember to bring um, your humanity to what we do. I think it really helps with reflective practice and with uh, being balanced. And let the heart, let a focus on people, drive the changes that we make. So think about the zigzag bridge as well for those of you looking at the slides or maybe just looking at the beautiful picture we put up. This is the zigzag bridge in Sydney, Australia at the, uh, the Chinese gardens and I thought it was absolutely beautiful and it, it really resonates with me because it, it says that the way forward sometimes you take some turns and you, you find your way and you should be mindful uh, about those changes. Uh, nice. Uh, in the slides uh, there are links to a series of uh, columns I've written for Library Journal under the, t the title Office Hours and many of the points that I've made uh, in this, this little half an hour I've had with you all uh, are from that column so you can um, follow up there as well. Uh, I wanted to come in a little short because I wanted to open this up maybe uh, to ask folks uh, how they um, might find balance, what they do, et cetera, or if there are questions, and I see Benjamin has raised his hand. So Benjamin, please go ahead and grab the mic if you want, or type, or whatever you'd like to do. Thanks, everybody. That is an excellent, excellent question. And is this a Benjamin that I know? Okay, nice. Yeah, I thought it might be. That's cool. Well, I appreciate the question. Um, I, and I will go back to the, I'll go to the end first and I'll say I think it should be an organic thing. Uh, I really respect uh, some of the, the my colleagues and, and the, the folks uh, in our field who do uh, share their their reflections and share kind of honestly you know, where they're at and, and the struggles they have. Uh, I think it's a, a very delicate thing to balance, I think, because we do, we don't want to, um, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to say, yeah, I'm vulnerable and yeah, I'm, I'm tired sometimes and yeah, I'm, you know, I'm overwhelmed. It's really hard to say those things and I could say yes to all three of those things. Um, but it's hard to put that out there. So I admire it when people do. Uh, I think that comes across uh, as more real as sometimes uh, folks 
it, it, I think we try to put our best selves forward. I think that's just a human trait, like online or, you know, when we're talking to people. But sometimes when we let a little bit of the, the realities come through, I think that can be very helpful. And I look at the, the folks that have shared struggles they've had um, online, uh, uh, and I think that that's great. I think that makes them human. Uh, I think that allows people to commiserate, uh, and it also allows other people to say, wow, it's not, I'm, I'm not alone. There are other people feeling that way as well. So again, it's a hard thing to do. Um, the folks that have done it that I, I know of, and I've, I've done a bit over the years, um, the thing that comes to mind, I'm not going to go too far down the path because it's still kind of it's amazing after all these years, when I lost my two Labradors within 30 days of each other in the summer of 2007, uh, I thought, you know, the world was ending. And the support that I had from my colleagues online, from librarians who had never met me and who had never you know, met me in person or, or seen Jake or Charlie. Okay, got to be careful here talking about this. Um, the outpouring of support, okay, working through it, from folks like uh, Karen Schneider, who wrote a beautiful piece about Jake on her blog, and you can still find that on her blog, um, and so many other people, so many other people that I felt I had so much support to get through that. And, you know, that uh, that is the power, too. And that goes back to what Boyd said about it's not an iPhone. It is a connection to people in certain ways that support me. And I think we, we probably everybody here listening or watching, I love the fact that we're not recording this, too. This is just so nice. It's just us having this, this chat together. Um, that we have people that, that support us online. And I could grab my phone right now and, and text a colleague of mine who I, I trust and I care about and say, wow, uh, you know, I made it through my day and my drive and I did my presentation and I feel pretty good about it and now I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's really cool to be able to have that and to be able to reach out to those certain people. So, Benjamin, a really long roundabout emotional-ish answer to say, Yes, I, I've seen examples of that. I've seen it done well. I've seen it done not so well, where maybe it's somebody just trying to get attention. Don't like that that, isn't, that as much. Um, but I think when it's real, you know that it's real. I think people know that it's real. <laughs> so thank you. Okay, Graham says, Graham, 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 says, uh, can well relate RE, -E, -E, the PLN, uh, seen it good and bad. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, sometimes I, I have refined my PLN over time. Um, uh, I think you should have challenging voices, but I think you should also filter out the voices that are just there that just kind of turn out to be irksome and, and you know, all of those things. Yeah, Jimmy, that's a good point. Oh, okay, Rachel says, any advice on how to politely moan about workplace online or should not do it at all? Um, I think that's a, there's a very fine line between coming off as being a complainer and being a negative person. Uh, especially if you're talking about your workplace. Um, what I found was, uh, and this is especially when I was working in the public library, um, to, t to turn it around as much as you could, there was something negative and then you saw something uh, that was kind of like a positive spin on that to highlight that. And that's where I did a lot of my blogging, where I might have been writing about something um, kind of negative from work, but really it was trying to turn that around and be positive. Um, okay, so and ben, Benjamin says, I would never complain about the workplace online even if I really want to. And you know I would agree and you never, I would never, I would never spell it out. Uh, like you'll say, oh yeah, I, I work here and this is happening and I'm unhappy. I, I just don't, I don't think that should be part of reflective practice. And that, yeah, Jenny, that's good. And I think there's, um, there, I don't want to miss something here. They, they, they scroll by so quickly. There's something about transparency. And Joyce, that's a good point. Larger issues in library land, I think that's a really good point. And I think I did a lot of my blogging that way as well. Um, so she, Nell says, how do you work in an environment where perhaps your colleagues don't want to be transparent? Um, uh, you. Uh, you model your own transparency, you know, you can only take care of yourself. You can't force your colleagues to be transparent. You can't force them to be reflective in what they're doing. 
Um, so for sure, you know, you model the behavior, you know, be the change you want to see and see how that goes. Yeah, try to get a few others on board as well. Sharing with others, yeah, absolutely. Openly, yeah, the whole sharing thing is so important. All right, hopefully you don't like drinking now, but um, I really like what you said about um, how, you know, I'll just quickly make sure that technology should not drive what the library does, actually tweet at it. Um, I thought I'd share with you what Christchurch Library um, has set as a disclaimer when presenting digital, digital services um, with regards to digital storytelling. Um, they said we are not replacing traditional story time with digital services, devices, but we need to show the benefits of adding another dimension to what is already working. So I thought they tie it together quite well. I, I am sorry, I don't think I heard all of your comments, and if there was a question at the end, I don't know if I heard it. I apologize for that. Wow, that is that is excellent, and I'm going to say no. I haven't seen anything like that, but I have been uh, advocating for professional development with teeth, <laughs> meaning that I think we need to be a lot more serious about how uh, we have our professionals um, you know, do their, their PD activities. Uh, and, and this makes total sense that maybe reflective practice should be part of it and and, and learning how to do that. That might be, uh, wow, that, that we did a, a week on it in the Hyperlink Library MOOC. Um, but that that's interesting. It might be something you know, to teach people to do because then it might help them. And then we could, uh, you, gosh, you could just unpack all of this stuff. The, the professional transparency, you know, how much you share and this, how you conduct yourself online and what you do, absolutely, wow, that is, that's really something to think about. I appreciate that. I have not encountered uh, the two kind of intertwingled, if you will, um, but uh, I think that's something good to think about. Oh, nice. Okay. I like that. Uh, I like that a lot. I thank you for sharing that and thank you for typing it in. Um, that's beautiful. Technology should not drive what the library does. And Christchurch has that kind of disclaimer. That is really beautiful. Oh, Rachel, thank you so much. Thanks. Oh, Joyce, oh, that's sweet. Thanks. A lot to think about, and thanks for your input. Benjamin, you're very welcome. Thank you for sharing. Thanks for your question. Oh, what a great word that is. Comforting. That's great. Marilla. Marilla. Sorry. Polly, uh, thank you for everything. I am on Twitter, and I, I just put it in. It's at mstephen7. Oh, yeah, more approachable. I, no, you're making sense, absolutely. Oh, how wonderful. I, I wish I was there. I would love that. I so enjoyed my time in New Zealand. Lisa, thank you. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it may be a while. I think I'm, I will maybe in Australia in the spring. It's close, I know. Oh, and Polly's going to have some wine. I think that's a really good idea. <laughs> Cheers to Polly. Oh, I like that. Uh, reflective journals, part of staff meetings. Nice. I'm clicking on the Flickr link. Oh, what a beautiful picture of the, the zigzag bridge. <laughs> 